Hey everybody, it is time for chapter 14. Chapter 14 is a fun one. It's going to be about um, patterns of inheritance or genetics. So what we're going to look at here is why you have the genes that you do and how your genes that you have affect the way that you look or different things that you're able to do or not able to do. So this is actually going to be a lab that we're going to look at in class next week. So um, if we start here, we're talking about heredity. It's kind of interesting because in the um, 1900s, they still believed in a couple of strange things. Um, and so after they figured everything out, we came up with these assumptions. So the first one is that constancy of species concept. And that's saying that heredity is going to occur within a species. What do I mean by that? Well, back in the day, they thought that they could actually form one of these, right? So if you had a man and a horse mate together, that you would have something to be half man, half horse. Now we both know that that's not true, and so that whole constancy of species is what we're talking about there. Um, classical assumption two is that traits are transmitted directly, and so what that means is you don't have any sort of blending, right? If you had a person with red hair who marries someone with brown hair, you're not necessarily going to get reddish brown hair. You could have strict red hair show up, or you could have strictly brown hair show up. Okay, so what we're going to talk about a lot in here is going to be hybridization. And hybridization is going to be where you cross two different types of the same organism, right? So if we we're talking about flowers, and these flowers could either have white flowers or purple flowers, if you crossed a white flower with a purple flower, that would be a hybridization, okay? All right, now this next part here, <clears throat> when we talk about characters and traits, this is an important section. So a character you can think of like a category, and that category can have different choices within it. The choices within it are going to be the traits. So as far as a character goes, you could have eye color, hair color, weight, height. And then if we talk about the traits for eye color, that could be blue, brown, green, hazel, right? For um, hair color, it could be black, brown, red, blonde. Um, so that's the difference between the two. So character is a general category that can vary, and traits are the actual variants that an organism has. Um, so if you ever look at a family, you might notice that like two of the kids look very alike or something like that, and then like there's one offspring that doesn't look like them. That's going to be due to something called segregation, and that's just talking about the random combination of genes that you can get from our whole meiosis discussion that we had before. So segregation is going to be when you have some offspring looking in one way and then others are exhibiting a different look. Um, and that's honestly what started Mendel to start looking at all of these different things that were happening in genetics. So um, when they started looking at genetics, there was a couple of things that they noticed that were like, huh, that's kind of standing out to us. One is that you can have a trait that disappears in one generation and then reappears unchanged in future generations. So, for example, you could have um, a grandparent with blue eyes. Their offspring don't have blue eyes. They have brown eyes. And then all of a sudden blue eyes show up in the next generation of children. And then number two is the whole segregation. Why do we have some offspring that look exactly the same and then we have others that don't look like anybody else? So that's why they started looking at stuff. Another reason is because there are going to be some traits that are way more likely to be represented than others. And mathematically, when they put numbers to it, they said, oh my god, there, there's definitely going to be others that are way more well represented. So Mendel was going to be, he's known as the father of genetics, and he was a monk, and he began experimenting with genetics by using the pea plant. So a lot of people have said, why did he use the garden pea? Um, and I think I've got a picture here to show you. Yeah, this is what the pea plant actually looked like. So why would he choose to use that? There's a couple of reasons. First, he knew to expect certain results because there had already been a little bit of research done on it. Second, there's a lot of true breeding varieties of those plants out there. And what we mean by true breeding is like they were either a white flower or a purple flower. They didn't have like half white, half purple, or striped purple and white or something like that. Um, the other one is that pea plants are small and easy to grow, and they have a fast generation time, right? If we were doing this with humans, you know, that takes nine months, and then you're going to have to, you know, see what characteristics show up later. So with a plant, it was much easier. And then another really important part is that both the male and the female organs are enclosed in the pea flower. So they can self-fertilize, but we can also um, control the pollination process. Okay. 
So if we talk about what Mendel used to do with his little experimental divine design, um, first thing was he allowed pea plants to self-pollinate for a few generations, and that was to make sure he was working with pure breeding plants. And so what that means is if he had a white one, he would like that white one to self-fertilize and self-fertilize and self-fertilize and see if all of their offspring were white. Same thing with a purple one. If he had anything weird show up, he didn't use that plant. So once he figured out they were purebreds, then he would do crosses between the varieties. So he would cross a white flowered plant with a purple flowered plant. He would look at the offspring, and then he would let that offspring self-fertilize for a few generations to see if anything weird showed up. So what he found was he studied seven different characters, and I've got them listed right here. He looked at the colors of the flowers. He looked at the position of the flowers, whether they came off of the side or at the tips of the plant. He looked at the color of the seeds, yellow versus green. He looked at the shape of the seeds, brown versus kind of dehydrated and wrinkled looking. The pod shape, once again, inflated versus constricted. The pod color, green versus yellow. And the stem length, so whether they were tall plants or whether they were dwarf. And when he did all of this stuff, he noticed that when he compared how many purple to white and he made it into a ratio, it pretty much came out to three to one almost every single time. So that got him thinking that something is going on here that's not just chance. There must be a way to predict this. So what he did is if we look at what Mendel's experiment actually entailed, it looks like this. So we've got our true breeding purple and our true breeding white right here. He crossed them and this generation, um, that first generation is called the F1 generation, so that first generation of offspring. And what he found was when he did this, they were all purple every single time, 100% of the time. Then what he would do is let these purple ones self-fertilize for a couple of generations. And then what he found, see if we can get this to work, is that he would get purple 75% of the time and he would get white 25% of the time. And so he said there's some sort of a trend that's happening here and we need to figure this out. So the F1 generation was going to be that first generation of offspring and then you had the F2 generation which was going to be that second generation after letting the F1 generation self-fertilize. How we use them in um, genetic problems.